Okay, so we, we already talked about insensible water, which is, is water loss that occurs and you don't really have sensation that it's occurring. Uh, things like breathing and basal level sweat production, tra cutaneous transpiration. But then there's some loss that's going to be sensible. And sensible water loss is going to include things like urination. And yes, you should be aware when you are urinating. If you're not, it might be an issue. So urination is a sensible water loss, water loss, and then sweating can be. So we have that basal level sweat that's usually insensible. You don't know that it's happening, but it is happening right now. And then there's sweating, especially when it's elevated. And usually that elevated sweating is during exercise or other stressful situations and it's going to form wetness that's noticeable on your skin and may collect on clothing as well. Okay, so one last thing that we have to quantify in terms of water loss and water gains, water balance, fluid balance. You are under a minimal amount of water that must be lost on a daily basis. And that's just simply going to be referred to as obligatory water loss. Okay, so obligatory water loss. So Obligatory just simply because you're obligated to lose this water. There's, there's no real way to get around it. We all have a minimum water loss per day. Cannot be prevented. So you can probably think about some of the losses that we've already talked about that are going to be obligatory or under obligation. Things like the water during respiration. Cutaneous transpiration. So in addition to respiratory loss and the cutaneous transpiration loss, you also have a minimal amount of urine that you're going to generate. And that minimum urine production is actually going to be beneficial. So trying to prevent it would be adverse. Uh, really, the minimum urine production is to prevent toxin buildup. So to prevent the buildup of toxins. You know, we're always constantly interacting with toxins, producing things like metabolic toxins, um, protein breakdown, and things like that generate metabolic toxins. And we need to remove them from the blood, otherwise they can really cause some severe issues. Now, the one adverse effect that comes out of this obligatory water loss is an individual that's dehydrated so a dehydrated individual is just simply going to continue to become more dehydrated. So dehydrated individuals become more dehydrated. 
And as you become more dehydrated, there's a lot of consequences to that. One of them is ions begin to build up, and in particular, things like potassium begin to build up in the extracellular fluid. And that potassium can cause issues with things like the heart and heart contraction. So we're always going to be under this influence to become more and more dehydrated, which means that we want to continually consume water because the obligation needs to be met. We need to continually consume. And fortunately, from a biological perspective, we have a drive that helps us to know when to consume. And that's what we're going to talk about now, knowing when to consume. Can you see that okay? That's kind of small, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's because you're sitting in the back. <laughs> You'd rather be spit on in the back? <laughs> All right, so knowing when to consume, this is the biological pathway. It's referred to as the renin angiotensin aldosterone or RAA pathway. And this is one of the ways in which we regulate blood volume, blood pressure, and then the levels of a variety of ions within the blood. Okay? And the drive to consume water or not to consume water is going to be based off of our blood volume and our blood pressure and then also the ions that we have in the bloodstream. Okay, so knowing when to consume, really this is going to be get that arrow off there. This is going to be about fluid intake regulation. So regulating our fluid intake. Now what in your mind is our chief regulator of intake? When do you know, how do you know when to consume? What's the, what's the outward cue? When you're thirsty. When you're thirsty. So fluid regulation is going to be governed by thirst sensation. So part of the question becomes, why do we become thirsty? Why do we have this sensation called thirst? And what it comes down to is, right now, no one in the room is drinking. You may have something, a beverage in front of you, but nobody's drinking. Okay, now Meredith's drinking. <laughs> what is happening between not drinking and drinking. Well, the body is undergoing dehydration. So if you ain't consuming, you dehydrate. <laughs> well, no, not exactly, but Typically, you take a drink of water, within about 15 minutes that water is left, the digestive system is now in the bloodstream. And then you begin to dehydrate. That's supposed to be consumption. I'm for your dough. And I spelled cum-mumption. <laughs> Okay, so dehydration occurs between consumptions. And as this happens, the things that change, the, the consequences of this is for blood osmolarity to increase. What else would happen with, so blood osmolarity, remember osmolarity is that measurement that takes reference both the water and the solute. So if osmolarity is increasing, Water is dropping, solutes are increasing in concentration. If we're losing water, we're losing blood volume, and pressure is going to go down. Disaster. 
So blood pressure is going to continue to drop. So right now, you consume something, begins to filter into the blood, flow into the blood through the digestive system, and then it's going to begin to dissipate. And we're losing it through breathing and through cutaneous transpiration and through the urine formation. So these two things are happening all of the time. Plasmolar is increasing blood pressure, is decreasing. Now, if you think back to the circulatory system, remember the carotid bodies and the aortic bodies, and we had those pieces of tissue within the vasculature that would detect the chemoosmolarity and the pressure of the blood. With our drop or our decrease in blood pressure, picked up by those sensors in the vasculature, sends a signal back to a higher brain center. That higher brain center interprets the data as, hey, we need to initiate a hormone cascade. So blood pressure begins to drop, signal picked up by the peripheral nervous system passed into the higher brain center, higher brain center initiates this hormone cascade, what is going to be the result of this hormone cascade, and bring blood pressure back up. Okay, so we cause this hormone, I'm five years old now, and I spell cascade. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to generate this hormone cascade. The hormone cascade is going to result, or really the hormones that are going to be generated, we're going to have renin that's going to be produced. And renin is a hormone that is generated by the kidney. So as you can see over here in the figure that I'm showing, Dehydration begins, or there's other things that could happen. You haven't had enough salt, which most of us have more than we need, or you have major blood rot loss. So all of those things lead to a decrease in blood volume. That decrease in blood volume leads to a decrease in blood pressure. That decrease in blood pressure is sensed by the aortic bodies, the carotid bodies, basically the pressure detectors, the baroceptors in the vasculature, sends a signal back to higher brain center, initiates the, the cascade of hormones. And we're going to have the cells of the kidney that begin to generate and pump out renin. So renin levels begin to increase in the bloodstream. Now renin has a target that begins to produce a hormone called angio tensin 2. Okay? So renin is increasing and we're going to begin to generate angiotensinogen or angiotensin rather 2. Okay? So angiotensin 1 is picked up by the lungs or is found in the lungs and through a hormone complex called ACE, which is angiotensin converting enzyme. ACE activity takes angiotensin 1 and converts it into angiotensin 2. So in the presence of renin, we're going to have stimulation and production of angiotensin 2. So now angiotensin 2 levels are going to begin to increase. The liver will also respond here by generating this hormone called angiotensinogen. And angiotensinogen is going to be involved in the production of angiotensin 1. Basically, what I'm giving you is this pathway right through here, through the liver and through the lungs, and through the action of ACE, angiotensin, angiotensinogen converting enzyme. Angiotensin converting enzyme would get an increase in angiotensin 2. By the way, any of you have ever heard of a blood pressure drug called an ACE inhibitor? This is where an ACE inhibitor is going to, is going to work. It's going to work on that enzyme in the lungs. It's crazy as it is. So ang angiotensin 2 levels begin to increase. So by this point, what I have is increased angiotensin 2 levels. 
So angiotensin II has increased, but I haven't done anything to repair the, the, increase, the decrease in blood volume, decrease in blood pressure. So I still also have a high level of austerity. So osmolarity levels remain high. Angiotensin level, angiotensin II levels are increasing. So these are both going to be detected. One of the places where this data is going to be detected is in the hypothalamus. And in particular, we're going to have specialized cells that act as osmoreceptors. So in the hypothalamus, we have osmoreceptors that detect the changes in osmolarity and the increases in angiotensin II. Now, you probably should expect that the hypothalamus is going to respond. So the hypothalamus is stimulated by these two increasing variables. And the result is to begin to produce a hormone that goes by a variety of different names. I most frequently have referred to it as anti diuretic antidiuretic hormone also can be known by its abbreviation which would be ADH it's also sometimes referred to as either vasopressin or arginine and vasopressin those are all the same hormone different names for the same hormone antidiuretic hormone or ADH so antidiuretic hormone is going to be produced now, as antidiuretic hormone is produced and is beginning to flow out of the hypothalamus, by the way, anyone remember what part of the hypothalamus, or uh, yeah, really, what part of the hypothalamus and where it's being released from? Produced from the hypothalamus. It's coming from the superoptic nucleus, and it is generated and released axonally, or transported axonally to the posterior pituitary where it's released. So this is one of those hormones that's generated in the hypothalamus, what's released by the posterior pituitary. So antidiuretic hormone enters the bloodstream. And the, the kind of big 300,000 foot view here is that we're going to have water that's conserved by the kidneys. So the kidneys begin to alter their function. And really what begins to happen is normally aquaporins are present in the collecting duct. And you'll remember that as we we're talking through the process of producing urine, we've always we were always basically generating really, really dilute urine. Without aquaporins in the collecting duct, that dilute urine, urine gets passed into the bladder. And so it's not water conserving. That would be when we have higher volume of water in our blood than is needed. Here we have lower volume of blood, so we want to conserve water. So antidiuretic hormone is actually going to cause aquaporin to be inserted into the collecting duct in the kidney. And as that water that's really dilute comes through, it's going to cross through the aquaporin down its concentration gradient. Because remember, we made the kidney really, really salty. And we tried to maintain the kidney to be really, really salty. And if the kidney is really, really salty and the urine is really, really dilute, we have a concentration gradient for water that favors the movement of water to be recaptured into the kidney and then it's picked up by the capillary supply in the kidney. And blood begins to remain, I'm sorry, water begins to remain in the bloodstream rather than being lost in urine. So this is a counteractive step to at least not let blood pressure continue to drop because of further loss of water. But there's some other things that happen as well. So with the antidiuretic hormone being produced by this, the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus also is stimulated, and it results in a portion of the brain called the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex to be stimulated. Now, we didn't really go through a whole lot of brain physiology, but 
Suffice it to say that the cerebral cortex has a lot to do with decision making in the organism. And one of the things that the cerebral cortex keeps track of is thirst. And it's going to be the cerebral cortex under these conditions of decreasing blood pressure that initiates a thirst sensation. Okay, so a thirst sensation. So what are the physiological things that happen here? We're, we're now beginning to conserve water, but that's not good enough. We also need to bring water in because we have that obligatory water loss that we need to cover. So just reducing the loss of water is not going to be beneficial enough. We also have to stimulate the organism to say, oh, I'm thirsty, and then they'll trigger the, the drinking response. So cerebral cortex is going to be responsible for generating the thirst signal. So what is the thirst signal? What is that actually going to entail? Does everybody have all of this? Let's go ahead and give myself a little more room. Okay, so what are some things that happen when you're thirsty? Well, your mouth gets a little dry, right? So you get dry mouth, and the reason that is is because during this thirst help, uh, sensation, salivation, I almost spelled salivation. Yeah, you might need salivation if this doesn't work right. Salivation is decreased. Okay, so saliva production is decreased. And in part, the hypothalamus is going to inhibit the salivary glands. So there's a connection between the hypothalamus and the salivary glands. And in one sense, this is actually a sympathetic nervous system response. So as this sympathetic nervous system response occurs, oh, dang it, started in the bottom of my page. Okay, salivation decreases, hypothalamus inhibits the gland, it's a sympathetic nervous system response. And really what's going on here with the decrease in salivation is the capillaries in the gland are what are being affected. So capillary pressure drops. And a salivary gland basically is nothing more than a capillary supply that allows some of the fluid to come out of the blood into the, into the duct to be moved up this, the, the salivary gland. So capillary pressure drops. What would be the consequence of that drop in salivary of capillary pressure, rather? Well, that filtration rate out of the blood, out of the plasma, is going to drop. Okay, so now we don't have as much saliva that's being generated. And this is what really begins to produce the dry mouth. <coughs> so we begin to produce the dry mouth just because we don't have as much saliva that's being generated because we've inhibited capillary blood supply through the salivary gland. All right, so what do you do when you get a dry mouth? What's that? What do you, what do, you do when your mouth's dry? You drink. You go to consume. 
Okay? So this is, I mean, that's really one of the biggest motivators. We hate dry mouths. And so we go to find a drinking fountain or we go and find a glass of water or whatever. So the response to this thirst sensation, what's going on in the cerebral cortex and also the dry mouth, is consumption. Or at least for most people, it's consumption. Now, what happens when you consume? So you have water and food that are taken in. And the fluid that is consumed with that water or that meal, it's going to travel through the mouth into the small intestine that I'm just going to abbreviate as SI. So water comes through the mouth, and initially it moistens the mouth. And as that fluid travels to the small intestine, it's going to begin to be absorbed. And as it's absorbed, the fluid's pulled into the blood, and we begin to rehydrate the blood. So we have rehydration of the blood. Now, we just increased fluid into the blood, so what's the result here? Well, the result is to have a change in blood characteristics. So change in blood characteristics. So things like a transient increase in blood pressure, and a transient decrease in osmolarity. So blood pressure goes up, osmolarity goes down. Blood continues to circulate, and as blood continues to circulate, those osmoreceptors are now going to detect a higher amount of pressure, a lower amount of osmolarity, and so they're going to be deactivated. So we're going to lift that signal from the osmoreceptor that's going to the higher brain cells. This response is typically activated fully within about 30 minutes. And then it will last longer. So here lies a little bit of a conundrum. Right, because it's going to take 30 minutes for us to basically say, oh, I'm no longer thirsty. So there's actually something that's going to happen in that intervening 30-minute time period. This is your long-term response. So 30 minutes in, out, you know, you consume that beverage. I go to the drinking fountain, and almost instantaneously I'm like, oh, and I'm refreshed. But this mechanism isn't fully on until 30 minutes after I just consumed the food or the beverage. So one thing that we can say from experience is that the thirst sensation is inhibited quicker than that 30 minute time scale. Thirst sensation is inhibited quicker. So we actually have a second response that's occurring here. And this second response is a quicker, short-term response. And this, sh this short-term, this quicker, short-term response is going to span the gap so to speak. So it's going to get us from that moment of consumption up to 30 minutes where we can have deactivation of the osmoreceptors and have the neurological stuff going on be reduced so that we eliminate or pull down our thirst sensation. So this quicker, shorter term response 
it's going to work like this. When you have that water consumption, so upon water consumption, one of the things that happens first, as that food or beverage moves through the oral cavity, moves through the mouth, the dryness, which thinking back was one of the stimuli for consumption in the first place, the dryness in the mouth is going to be reduced. Now, when the dryness is removed, the thirst sensation is going to be lost quickly. And you've all experienced that before. You go and get water, you consume a little bit of water, your dry mouth goes away, and ah, you're refreshed. But this response here only lasts a few minutes. So only lasts for a few minutes, and your thirst would return. And the reason that thirst returns is because, remember, it takes 30 minutes to have the changes to the blood. So at this point, there would be no changes in those characteristics in the blood. Pressure is still low and osmolar energy is still going to be elevated. So we have five minutes where thirst is going to be inhibited, and then expecting at 30 minutes we're going to inhibit it for long term. So what about this next kind of 25 minutes? Part of this short-term um, short system that spans the gap when you consume water, it goes through the mouth and it ends up in the stomach and in the small intestine. And in the stomach and the small intestine, you're going to have distension of those two organs. So you're going to have distension of the stomach and the small intestine. That distension is actually going to feed back through a nervous system loop onto the cerebral cortex and results in a thirst sensation or the thirst sensation being lost. Now again, this is distension of the stomach and the small intestine, so we're still not going to have a change in the blood characteristics. However, this particular mechanism of distending the, stum the, the stomach and the small intestine is going to have a longer effect than just wetting the mouth. This is usually between 30 and 45 minutes. And so in that 30 to 45 minutes, there's still no blood change, or we're going to begin to approach the changes in blood within 30 to 45 minutes. So no change in blood thirst would come back. As long as we've consumed enough to change the blood significantly, then that 30 minute long term response, the longer term response is going to take over, going to uh, pull down the osmol receptor activation, and you'll continue to feel like you're hydrated enough. So wet your mouth, distend your stomach and small intestine, and reduce the osmoceptors to overcome that thirst response. So now I want to loop back around to kidney physiology. And though I've briefly alluded to this, Previously, we can actually regulate output. 
And in fact, it is sort of a highly regulatable, I don't know if that's even really a word, probably this stuff. Your output is a highly regulatable variable. So to regulate output, really the end result here is to change your in volume. So how do we actually change your in volume? In the way that we change your in volume, there's going to be two different mechanisms. And the two mechanisms are going to be referred to as sodium dependent and sodium independent. So sodium dependent and sodium independent mechanisms are going to facilitate this process of regulating and changing urine volume. So when we're linked to or re regulated due to sodium, we are going to have sodium excretion that is equal to water excretion. In other words, sodium follows water, water follows sodium. They go hand in hand. So sodium and water are linked and regulated together. Sodium excretion equals water excretion. They are proportional. As I've already alluded to, the hormone, antidiuretic hormone, is going to be central to understanding how we regulate output. <clears throat> All right, so you can see right in the middle there, <clears throat> you have a hypothalamic pituitary kidney axis or renal axis. The hypothalamus produces antidiuretic hormone delivers it to the posterior pituitary by way of the axonal transport where it is then released into the bloodstream when it's called upon. Antidiuretic hormone as it's secreted circulates in the bloodstream and interacts with the kidneys. Now antidiuretic hormone During dehydration, we are going to have, well, what, during dehydration, what's happening to the blood? We have a decrease in water, and what are we going to have for sodium? Increase for, so, for sodium, and it's basically going to be proportional. And if you're paying attention, you realize that this is about the blood volume and this is about the osmolarity. So blood volume, osmolarity. And we already know that this results in that thirst process that we've already discussed. And release of antidiuretic hormone being released from the posterior pituitary, produced in the hypothalamus, released by the posterior pituitary. Now, antidiuretic hormone travels through the bloodstream to the kidney. And in particular, in the kidney, it's going to interact in two places. One will be the distal convoluted tubule, and the other will be the collecting duct. 
So the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. What you're looking at here in this picture, this is the lumen of the nephron. This is my concentrated urine or my urine that I formed. These are cells of the collecting duct. This is the interstitial fluid. These also can be the cells of the distal, uh, the distal convoluted tubule. We're just looking specifically at the collecting duct here. So this is the other tissue. Remember vasopressin, what is vasopressin's other name? Antidiuretic hormone. So we're just using vasopressin here. This is antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone interacts with the tissue in the kidneys, in particular the cells. It targets the cells of the collecting duct and the distal convoluted tubule and stimulates aquaporins to be produced. So we have aquaporin production. Now check it out. Vasopressin, and I'm, I'm going to just step back here real quick. How is this hormone working? What kind of second messenger, messenger system? Yeah. Cyclic AMP second messenger system. So hopefully you're picking up on things like PKA. There's cyclic AMP. This is adenylate cyclase. There's the enzyme. I mean, you already know this pathway. So here's arginine vasopressin or vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone interacting with its receptor to, through a G protein, activate adenylate cyclase to cyclize ATP into cyclic AMP, which turns on PKA. PKA, it's protein kinase A. What do protein kinases do? They phosphorylate proteins. Protein kinase A, here's your protein phosphorylation. And in that process of protein phosphorylation, you are basically preparing the aquaporin, that's the protein that's being phosphorylated, to be activated, which when it's activated goes and inserts in the luminal wall of both the collecting duct and the distal convoluted tube. How cool is that that you were just able to follow along with that? That's some intense physiology and you all just follow along flawlessly. It's a good thing that we're getting close to the end of the semester. Okay, so antidiuretic hormone stimulates the production of aquaporins. We now know that it's through a cyclic AMP second messenger system. The aquaporin itself is phosphorylated, activated, and it gets stuck into the luminal side of the collecting duct cell. So cells of the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. What's the result here? What happens when those cells get aquaporins inserted in their membranes? They become permeable to water. So the cells of the distal convoluted tubule collecting duct are now permeable to water. Now, in here, we have low sodium, high water. Out here, this is the interstitial fluid of the kidney. It's always maintained as being very, very salty. Does everybody have all of this? So the cells are now permeable to water. The renal medulla, compared to the luminal fluid, is going to be hypertonic. 
hypertonic. You all understand why? Hypertonic literally means high solutes. The renal medulla is this tissue out here. There are more solutes here than here. What now can we say about water? More water here, less water here. Concentration gradient specific for water. So the renal medulla is hypertonic because we have increased solute concentration compared to the filtrate in the nephron and lower amounts of water because those solutes are matter. They have mass and they take up space and they consume the space that could be consumed by the water. And so we have a decrease or a lower water concentration here in the interstitial fluid compared to here in the tubule of the nephron. <laughs> So we develop our concentration gradient, set up between the tubule, and in fact, this is what is really always maintained between the tubule and the medulla. We always have that concentration gradient. But now that I've activated aquaporin phosphorylation through the vasopressin, vasopressin receptor, I now can utilize that concentration gradient because we're permeable to the water. So with aquaporins present, we can use that concentration gradient that's constantly established, and water will remain in the tissue and will excrete uh, in lower amounts from the lumen. So it comes back into the tissue, out of the urine, concentrating the urine, reducing the water, increasing the solute of the water, so water excretion in the presence of antidiuretic hormone decreases. The opposite is true when we have too much water and we need to get more, get rid of more water. Vasopressin levels decrease because the hypothalamus is no longer producing the ADH. This system gets turned off. Aquaporins no longer persist in the luminal side of, of the cell and water levels remain in the, at a high level, remain in the lumen of the nephron. By the way, these aquaporins here, this is aquaporin 2 that gets inserted into the uh, tubular wall. These aquaporins here, aquaporin 4 and aquaporin 3, they're actually going to always be present. They're ubiquitously expressed in the membrane. So we're changing the permeability of here, and as water begins to cross in, because of the aquaporin 2 that's present, they'll just continue to flow right on down that concentration gradient through aquaporin 3 and aquaporin 4. Those aquaporins 2, do they burn out? They just cease to exist at some point? Yeah, so basically you're asking how did they get turned off? Right. Well, what happens is the membrane is continually being turned over, and so they're being removed back out under at a, at a basal rate. As long as we have Membrane fusion that's occurring at a high enough rate, they're going to remain elevated. So it's kind of like a dripping faucet. Okay, I'll see you uh, on Friday. When's our, is our